see. Um, the next bill on our agenda is House File 1039, Representative Freiburg. And um, we're planning on laying this over for possible inclusion in our, in our bill. Um, I'll move House File 1039, so the bill's before us. And uh, Representative Freiburg, you have an amendment that was submitted late. Do um, you want to explain what that amendment does? And then we'll just discuss the, the bill. Representative Freiburg. Sure, the amendment was not submitted before the committee's amendment deadline, but it would be my intention to have it incorporated into the bill at a later time. Uh, it reflects a suggestion from the Department of Administration to change the grants administrator of the program I'll describe when I describe the bill from the Department of Administration to the Council on Disability. Thank you, Representative Freiburg. And you want to describe your bill then? Sure. House File 139 would create a grant program to fund sensory accessibility improvements in public places. Uh, Minnesota has historically focused on physical accessibility, and physical accessibility is obviously critically important to many, many people, but it doesn't meet the needs of all people with disabilities. The autism community and others with sensory needs would benefit from having accessible spaces in public access spaces throughout our state. Uh, my testifiers will give you some examples of sensory accommodations, but they uh, frequently do not need to be major changes to structures or anything along those lines. This grant is a small investment to set an example for our whole state of how sensory friendly accessibility options can improve our communities and increase inclusion. So um, I think with that, uh, I have a few testifiers. I think Jillian Nelson might be the first one to go. Um, I have the list of, uh, we can start with Jillian. I have Trevor Turner on my list, then Jillian, and then Jen, Jen, Jen Reeder. Um, welcome to the committee, Ms. Nelson, and uh, um, identify yourself and start and proceed with your testimony. Um, good morning, Chair and committee members, and thank you so much for this early morning meeting to discuss a bill very close to my heart. I'm Jillian Nelson, and I'm the Community Resource and Policy Advocate for the Autism Society of Minnesota. I'm also an autistic adult that experiences many sensory challenges. The movement of accessibility has been a hot topic throughout the Capitol complex the last couple of years, but with far too much of that conversation focused on accessibility modifications to public spaces to assist individuals with physical needs such as parking, ramp, parking ramps, bathrooms, handrails. And while we celebrate this progress and rejoice in the reduction of barriers, these changes do not increase accessibility for a large portion of the disability community. If we are going to focus on building inclusion and creating one Minnesota, then we need to include individuals with sensory needs, which often come with invisible disabilities. Individuals with autism compromise one out of every 44 Minnesotans. And they are not the only group that has sensory challenges. This would impact people with PTSD, mental health issues, developmental disabilities, and more. House File 139 is a two-year grant appropriation of $500,000 to allow for increased accessibility to public spaces, including state, county, city, and other public access spaces. The bill outlines four options that can be funded through the grant, including a quiet, sensory-friendly space, a design modification to the actual building to meet sensory friendly standards, mobile kits to be used in the space, or additional service times or spaces meant to provide a quieter experience. This bill also has an expectation that organizations utilizing the grant will have appropriate training on utilizing the modifications. Our community has built our own accommodations for years in this arena and has gratefully had an influx of community partnerships creating recreational accessibility such as the Vikings, the Minnesota Wild, soon to be joined by the Timberwolves and the Twins. We have seen groups such as Children's Theater, the Walker Arts Center, Minnesota Orchestra, Como Zoo, Minnesota Zoo, Three Rivers Parks, Minneapolis Parks, the Bakken Museum, the Science Museum, the Children's Museum, the Bell Museum, and also the Guthrie Theater. And while arts and recreation are vital to a meaningful life, they're not the only realm that people with sensory challenges require accessibility. I personally find it reprehensible that our state is leading the way in community sensory inclusion while our public spaces that are vital to civic and community engagement are still inaccessible from a sensory standpoint. This bill will create opportunities to create accessible spaces in public arenas that are vital to so many areas of our life. We must appear in county buildings to access supports. We need to access government buildings to advocate for our rights. We need to be in places that allow us to navigate our services, communities, and protections in a dignified manner without causing harm and discomfort. This bill may not seem life-saving to you, 
But people with autism experience suicide rates three times higher. And all too often, this is because of isolation and exclusion. When we normalize accessibility, we normalize disability and increase acceptance in society. This type of systemic change will not only change buildings, but it will change the health and life outcomes for an entire population. I thank you for your support of House File 139, and I yield my time. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. Uh, the next person I have is Trevor Turner. Mr. Turner, please identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Trevor Turner, and I'm the Public Policy Director for the Minnesota Council on Disability. Um, we wanted to express our support for um, House File 139 um, and also the amendment that Representative Five proposing to move uh, the uh, grant program to the Minnesota Council on Disability. Um, we're actually working on a similar bill with Representative Elkins um, on a grant access accessibility program um, for digital accessibility. So we are more than willing and able and have the technical expertise to you know, be the administrator of this grants program. Um, the Minnesota Council on Disability supports House File 139. It creates a centrally accessibility grants program that can be used toward renovating spaces to be more accessible to those with central disabilities. Uh, Minnesotans are often excluded, Minnesotans with disabilities are often excluded from public spaces because they are inaccessible. Much like stairs are barriers to wheelchair users, PA systems are barriers to the deaf and hard of hearing, visual signs are barriers to the blind, and for the spaces that are overstimulating, crowded, or have too many distracting lights, are barriers to those with neurological and sensory disabilities. It is a human right to have access to public spaces, but when those spaces are designed without disabilities in mind, entire communities are excluded. The Minnesota Council on Disability supports any bill that aims to make public spaces accessible to everyone and allows Minnesotans with disabilities to be active participants in their communities. Often when public spaces are designed, whether intentionally or unintentionally, with people with disabilities are left out of the conversation and the design process. Sensory disabilities have also been misunderstood, ridiculed, or maligned for centuries in government and public institution. This means that many public spaces have been designed to prioritize aesthetics rather than functionality or accessibility. This bill seeks to rectify that by providing state agencies, counties, and cities in Minnesota funding to redesign their public spaces with sensory disabilities in mind. We urge the members of this committee to support this bill and support disability community. And thanks to you again, Mr. Chair and the members of the committee um, for your support of House File 139. I'm happy to take any questions and I yield my time. And the next person I have on the list is Jen Reeder. Please identify yourself and, and proceed with your testimony. Hello, I'm Jen Ryder, and I am a parent of a child with autism, and I have spent the majority of my career working in the arts and the last decade trying to make um, public spaces and the arts more accessible to people with disabilities. I'll specifically share challenges my daughter has. She's about to start driver's ed and how DMV and other places are like that with the lighting and the busyness and the hours she will never be able to navigate that without accommodations. And she has a host of friends and we have community members that have the same challenges of accessing spaces that you and I take for granted every day. And I think this is a perfect moment in history for this bill to be coming forward as we have all learned in the last year in an incredible way, how adaptations and accommodations can make life more accessible, can make life move forward and um, just, remove barriers and raise possibilities for all. It may, like Julian said, seem like a very simple thing, but this bill and creating accommodations in public spaces means the difference between my daughter, not only enjoying life in a meaningful way, but her sharing her gifts and talents with the world in a meaningful way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative New, I, I see you have your hand up as a, with a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I and I looked through I looked through all of our documents and I couldn't find that amendment. I know we didn't move the amendment, but I'm just wondering if um, with that A1 amendment, with that shifting um, this to the Council on Developmental Disabilities, does that also change that 10% for admin? Uh, Representative Freiberg. Um, I've got the amendment here. It was in the packet that was ma or emailed out to everybody. It's the A1, 
HO 139A1 amendment. Um, Representative Freiberg. Uh, thank you, Representative New Brindley. If, if the amendment is posted on the committee's website. I did pull it up before this started. Um, if you look to lines 1.6 and 1.7 of the amendment, it changes the word commissioner to the word council. So it, that's the that those are the lines dealing with uh, the 10% uh, set aside for administration. It just changes that so that the administration is housed at the council on disabilities instead of with the Department of Administration. Representative so would the would the thank you, Mr. Chair. So would the department with so would the Council on Disabilities get that ten up to ten percent, rather than the Department of Admin? Representative Freiberg. Uh, I believe that is correct. Uh, maybe Mr. Gehring or Ms. Roberts could confirm that. Uh, Mr. Gehring. Chair Representative New Brindley, the the amendment doesn't change anything about the access to the administrative costs, so it would be the same um, for the council. Representative New Brindley. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry, I, I, I still don't feel like I've got clarity. So, so that means the council could access that 10% for administrative costs as opposed to the Department of Admin. Repre or Mr. Mr. Gehring. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative New Brindley, yes, that's correct. Great, thank you. Representative Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It might be helpful if uh, one of the testifiers gives one or two specific examples of the changes that they're uh, asking. Uh, Ms. Nelson. Thank you, Representative Mason. Um, so a sensory friendly accommodation could be a number of things and we outlined four options in the bill. So like a quiet space would be something along the lines of a specific room that's set aside in a building that has been designed with sensory friendly needs. So it might have lower lights. It might have um, things that we call, we call them sensory tools or fidgets. Um, I actually have my fidget spinner right here um, and a wealth of other fidget items. There might be um, seating that meets different sensory needs that wouldn't be met in the other world, like proprioceptive or vestibular. Um, it's a little known fact that people actually have eight senses, not the five that were taught on Sesame Street. Um, for things like sensory friendly building modifications, it might be something like switching um, fluorescent lights or changing the way a building's painted to create um, an easier visual structure. Um, for mobile kits, the Minnesota Wild is a great example. They, they don't have a separate space at their venue. Instead, you go to customer service and say, I have some sensory needs. They give you a menu. You pick out what items would meet your needs. They put them in a bag and you go back to your seat and you get to enjoy the rest of your hockey game with the support you need. And then the quiet space, the quiet times are an option. Like the Guthrie Theater is a great example of that one. They actually have what they call relaxed performances for many of their shows that are a specific day where the theater is, the expectations of the theater are different. You are, you are allowed to come as you are. If you need to move during the show, move during the show. If noise needs to be made during the show, make noise. And they have the sensory friendly space. So we really want to design this grant to allow public access spaces to decide what sensory friendly accommodation is best for their culture and their space and their purpose so that it could be the most meaningful to both the businesses and the community. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. Uh, the next person on my list is Representative Drzkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, wondering, um, Mr. Turner, if you're still on, um, I agree with you. I think we have a huge government here in Minnesota. We spend billions of dollars on it. We need to make it accessible to everyone um, to support the bill. Um, but uh, I'm wondering, have you talked to the governor or urged him to take down the chain link fence around the Capitol so that that too can be accessible to everyone? Uh, Representative, Mr. Mr. Turner, I don't know if that's in the purview of this committee or admit Representative, or Mr. Tur Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Representative Dostoevsky. Um, No, we have not talked to the governor about the chain link fence surrounding the Capitol. Um, uh, because of the pandemic, most of the Capitol is, you know, off limits for almost everyone. And I would say that most people with disabilities are avoiding crowded spaces and think because of the pandemic. So I would say um, it's not a, a major concern for the Council on Disabilities simply because the Capitol grounds are primarily just for representatives and senators uh, to conduct business and to avoid pandemic-related illnesses. Representative Drzkowski, follow-up. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Mr. Chair, I hope that uh, we can uh, remove that uh, barrier around the Capitol to restore the public's access uh, to our uh, uh, our Capitol. And uh, I just think of the $300 million renovation that we did to make that place so beautiful. And uh, now it's apparently being mothballed uh, and not allowing people of disabilities or non-disabilities or everybody in the state to access it. Uh, thank you for the bill, uh, Representative Freiberg. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Draskowski. I see it, don't see any other hands up. So um, we're going to lay this over for possible inclusion. And uh, thank you, Representative Freiberg, for bringing the bill.